Well, welcome, everybody. My name is John Malcolm. I'm the vice president of the Institute for Constitutional Government and director of the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage uh, Foundation. Uh, and we're delighted that you could join this event, which is being co-sponsored uh, by both the Heritage Foundation uh, and the Federalist Society entitled Prevent This Tragedy, Meaningful and Sensible Approaches to Police Reform. A couple of housekeeping matters before we get started. Uh, this program is being recorded and will be posted within 24, 48 hours on Heritage's uh, website. If you would like to submit questions, you can do so through the uh, question feature, uh, which is, you know, you can see on the screen below how to do that. Uh, and we will try to get uh, to as many of them as we, uh, as we can in the short amount of time uh, that we have. So you can submit them in the question box there. So the events in the last three weeks following George Floyd's death have really been dizzying uh, and deeply disturbing. Uh, anger and mistrust of police officers seems to be breaking out all over the place. Uh, dozens of law enforcement officers have been attacked, and a couple, including the officer who killed George Floyd, have now been charged with murder. Police cars and a police station in Minneapolis have been torched, and a police station has been abandoned in the so-called so autonomous zone that has been established in Seattle. Amidst all of this, there has been a slew of police reform proposals uh, that are out there. The House Democrats have introduced a bill, the Justice in Policing Act. Senate Republicans have introduced the, Safe, um, the, the, the Justice Act. And uh, President Trump issued an executive order that he called Safe Policing for Safe Communities. And of course, there are many protesters who are insisting that police departments be defunded, which some cities are now pledging to do, or outright dismantled. In short, we have a lot to discuss in a short amount of time, and we have three excellent panelists to do just that. My colleague, Rachel Gressler, is a research fellow in the Grover M. Herman Center for the Federal Budget where her scholarship focuses on workplace issues and labor policy. Rachel has master's degrees in both economics and public policy from Georgetown. Prior to joining Heritage, Rachel worked for a number of years as a senior economist on the staff of the Joint Economic Committee of the Congress. She recently wrote an article for Heritage's blog site, news site, The Daily Signal, entitled, Confronting Police Abuse Requires Shifting Power from Police Unions. Rafael Manguel, is a fellow and deputy director of legal policy at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor of City Journal. He's written a number of articles on issues ranging from urban crime uh, and jail violence to criminal justice reform and lately, of course, on police reforms. His work is featured and mentioned in a, a wide array of publications. He's also a frequent uh, commentator on radio uh, and television. He got his undergraduate degree from Baruch College and his law degree from DePaul University. Uh, prior to joining the Manhattan Institute, Raphael worked in corporate communications department at the International Trademark Association, and his father was a police officer. Finally, we will hear from Bernie Carrick. Bernie Carrick is a highly decorated police officer. He began his career in law enforcement in, in the early 80s, working in the sheriff's offices in North Carolina and in New Jersey. He joined the NYPD in 1986 and quickly rose through the ranks. In 1998, Mayor Giuliani appointed Bernie as commissioner of New York City Department of Corrections, which included oversight of over 13,000 officers and several facilities, including Rikers Island. In 2000, Mayor Giuliani appointed Bernie Carrick as police commissioner, a position that he held for roughly 16 months. And of course, he was in that job uh, on the day of the 9-11 attacks and had to deal with its aftermath. Bernie's son, by the way, is also a current police officer in Newark, New Jersey. Well, all right, let's, um, let's get to this. Uh, there have been, as you all know, a, a lot of claims being made lately about systemic racism uh, in police forces. The Democrats in their bill have called for a ban uh, on racial profiling based on a disparate impact uh, analysis. Uh, and they want to have the police basically record the demographic data of virtually every police civilian encounter. And there are about 375 million of those uh, every year. They also want to bring back 
uh, and expand, in fact, Obama-era pattern and practice investigations by the Civil Rights Division and to give that authority to state's attorneys general. I, I'd like you, you, the reaction of any of you to this charge of systemic racism in the police department and whether you think these are good proposals or bad proposals. Sure, well, uh, I'd be happy to, to offer some initial thoughts. I mean, so the thing to remember here is that there is disproportionality, right? If you consider the share of the population constituted by black and brown Americans, uh, they are indeed overrepresented in things like police shootings and other uses of force. But share of the population, of course, is, is the wrong denominator to use because it, it ignores the reality uh, that blacks, black males in particular, account for an outsized share of violent crime. Uh, as well as violent, vic violent crime victims. And, and as uncomfortable as it might make some people to confront, uh, you know, that, that is an important fact because it's going to inform the deployment of, of police resources, which are limited. Um, and I don't think that anyone uh, would dispute the rationality of deploying police resources with regard uh, to crime trends. And, and when that happens, of course, that is going to produce um, uh, results that, that, that are not going to be uh, even when it comes to enforcement actions. And so, you know, when we say something like, uh, well, you know, blacks are 13% of the population, but 26% of those shot by police officers, we cannot from that uh, draw any real conclusions about, say, systemic racism in the criminal justice system, because what it ignores uh, is some really important factors that may inform why that disparity exists, independent of, uh, you know, things like racial animus, right? Uh, the reality is is, is that uh, black men constitute about 7% of the population, but almost 50% of all murder victims. Um, they have a homicide victimization rate that's about six times uh, that of their white counterparts, and they have a homicide commission rate that's about eight times that of their white counterparts. And, and those things are going to uh, inform uh, the data on police use of force and other uh, in, enforcement actions. Uh, and and I, I think it's unfair and, and, and unhelpful uh, to operate from the assumption that any disparity in criminal justice statistics uh, sh uh, shows racism. John, if I can. Yeah, please, Bernie, go right ahead. Um, you know, as somebody that ran, I, I ran Rikers, I uh, had 13,000 staff, 75% of that staff was black. Um, I ran the NYPD, uh, 55,000 strong, I think today, 60% of the NYPD is uh, minority officers. The bottom line, uh, both of these agencies, uh, you know, are, uh, they have demographics that are, you know, fall in line with the communities in which they work. Um, and in and, and all the time I've been in policing, um, 30, 35 years, have I seen racial incidents? Have I seen officers say the wrong thing, uh, perhaps do the wrong thing? Uh, at times, yes, uh, and those officers are held account for what they say and what they do. But this broad perception, uh, especially in the aftermath of the Floyd killing, which was which was a murder, uh, it was a murder by a cop. I don't care if the guy was in uniform or he wasn't in uniform, that was a murder. I, agree, I said that uh, from the first time I watched it. I also, I thought that he should be charged with first degree murder based on what I saw. Um, and I think the whole country was united behind it. But what happens is in a situation like that and others, you get mass hysteria, you get the mainstream media, uh, you get the pilers on, so to speak. Immediately, they make it a racial issue. And then they, they basically say that the entire police service, which I don't know the numbers, Raphael would know better than I, but I think there's 800,000 perhaps local, state, and federal law enforcement officers in this country. That one incident turned into every cop in this country is a racist. And the bottom line is, it's just not true. Um, and when you, you know, what the one thing that Raphael said that I would, I would urge listeners to focus and pay attention to, when you hear this racist you know, these racist, this racist rhetoric, if you will, when you hear that, a lot of times you will hear that police officers are killing black men more than they're killing whites, or they're killing unarmed black men more than they're killing whites. And at the end of the day, when you break those numbers down for 2019, for example, out of 
10, 10 million arrests and probably 300 million interactions with citizens in this country, 1,003 people were killed by police, shot and killed by police. When you break those numbers down in every category, um, whether they were armed, more whites were killed than blacks, whether they were unarmed, more whites were killed than blacks, and whether they had a toy gun, and that that you know that always makes big headlines. Some some guy was killed, you know, he had a toy gun and he was shot and killed by the police. Even that number, more whites were killed than blacks. And at the end of the day, you would never know that from the rhetoric. According to, you know, the 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 race baiters out there, you know, cops are annihilating the black men and women in this country. Here's the bottom line. It's not systemic. Um, what is systemic, though, and what concerns me, and this goes back to Raphael's comments, in major cities in this country, there is the systemic slaughter, in my opinion, of black men and women. But it's not by cops. It's by other blacks, whether it's Chicago, Baltimore, St. Louis, Milwaukee, and, and a number of other states. You have, you have murders at the rate that can't compare to a war zone in Iraq. Um, I think I think if anybody's going to focus on anything, the politicians of Washington, legislation, I, you know, I just find it mind boggling that they're attacking cops, but they're not attacking those issues because people are dying on a daily basis, daily, every single day in those communities. And it's like nobody's doing a damn thing about it. Yeah, so actually, the the Washington Post article that you where you cited that thousand and three figure deaths in in 2019, uh, they point out that 14 of the uh, only 14 were unarmed uh, African Americans. Now that's 14 too many, no question about it. But 14 out of roughly 375 million police civilian encounters does not speak to me of, you know, a bunch of white officers who with itchy trigger fingers who are running around targeting, uh, you know, unarmed black men. Um, but, you know, these perceptions, of course, can become a reality and lead to attacks uh, on police officers in those communities. We'll touch more on that, uh, on that a little later. Um, so, Rachel, in, in your article recently, you pointed out, and this is quote, uh, a review of 82 police union contracts in large cities by the Reuters News Service found that contracts often include provisions that obstruct discipline, erase discipline records, uh, and insert elevated standards of review that shield rogue police officers from justice. So what role, uh, if any, do you think police unions play in all of this and, and you know, what should be done about it? Yeah, so I think that's something that's lost in the national discussions about police reform is that policing is really a local issue and there are over 18,000 local departments across the US. And what it boils down to is no matter what good policies and prohibitions that we can all collectively agree on need to be accomplished, some of them put in place at the federal level, at the end of the day, if there's no accountability of the department and they can't discipline or terminate the officers who violate the policies that are put in place, then all that good work is for naught. And so looking at these studies that have reviewed union contracts across the US, you know, they find that collective bargaining has often allowed the police unions to fill those contracts with provisions that end up protecting bad cops. You know, some of those um, instances are they like, will allow them to erase discipline records. Um, they can disqualify complaints based on just time limits instead of actual substance of the complaint, or they might limit the officer interrogations, limit disciplinary actions, ban civilian oversight. And so time and again, I think these provisions have come into place to prevent the accountability and discipline from happening that would actually shift to change the culture over time. You know, you can't have an instance where a local police chief has actually jumped through the hoops, been able to terminate an officer, and yet that officer gets reinstated. And that's what's happening in one out of four cases of police being fired is that the union jumps in and defends them and they end up getting reinstated. There was a police chief in San Antonio who talked about an officer he fired not just once, but twice. And it also gets into the issue of, you know, having the data available 
because oftentimes those problematic officers can jump from one police station to another without them knowing what's in their record because of erasing those um, disciplinary records. And so what really needs to be done is looking down, drilling down at those local contracts. And it is good news to see, you know, Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Fry, who had called the unions the elephant in the room, the quote, impenetrable barrier. You know, now Minneapolis has stepped back from its contract and they're starting to relook at things. And I think that's part of the solution is it has to be holistic and you can't be driven by these contracts. In Connecticut, there is a law that actually allows the union contract to supersede the state law. Um, and so that's something that we need to be looking at is when are there cases that unions can actually write the law instead of having the police be the ones that are enforcing the law. So we need to peel back those restrictions and there might be a federal role there for stepping in and preventing any of that supersedence. I've heard of unions trying to, to buy the favors of legislators, but never to supersede them. That's, uh, that's a new one on me. Uh, uh, Bernie, were you were involved. I'm just curious when you were, when you were cheap in any of those negotiations or face any of these issues, I assume you did. Yeah. In New York city, you have a, a commissioner of labor relations that reports directly to the mayor, but I, I have to say, you know, I, I hear, uh, I, I hear Rachel's arguments, uh, and, and some of the things that have been said around the country, but but I, I honestly, from my perspective, who do I blame? I blame the administrations. I blame Congress. I blame state legislators. That's who I blame because they're the ones negotiating these things. It's not the union. The union comes in and says, this is what we'd like done. This is what we'd like to do or how we'd like to do it or this is why we think this should happen. But at the end of the day, this is a negotiation. There's there's a bunch of players in that room that do this. Um, so I, I I lay the blame not only on the unions, but all the players in this process that go through this stuff and allow them to do whatever it is they do that people think they shouldn't be doing. That's that's number one. But number two, to my in my own executive management style, I don't care what the unions do because I have a big table of organization that sits up on a wall. And when I look at it, it's the mayor to me, to my first deputy and my chief and all my bureau chiefs, the union's not up there. So if I have an officer and I've, I have fired many, I have disciplined many, um, it's been uh, quite, quite seldom uh, or, or not seldom at all um, that I've had uh, cases overturned where I had to bring them back. If you do it right and you administer right and you create due process, you know, I, I know there's a bunch of situations out there. They want a guy fired and they fire him right now. And, you know, it may be against due process. They didn't build the case in, in my management style. You know what? You start due process. You build a case against that officer when you flag them for abuse of force. So you flag them for stupidity or you whatever the case may be i think if it's done right it's done within the confines of the law and the administrative policy you know i i haven't had many problems so i i think it's a two-way sword i think there may be as rachel said there may be departments out there that you know they have these issues personally from the nypd's issue and we we have in the nypd as as rafael probably can attest to um we have oversight like no over no other oversight in the country you know whether it's the internal affairs division this the civil complaint review board the the city council the inspector general the doi i mean everybody in the sun is an oversight um you know i don't know how much more they can oversight them but um that's my opinion well yeah, and that's that up because I think there are a lot of differences you know obviously with thousands and thousands of departments across the U.S. some are going to have problems with the union and some aren't and if the heavy hand of the federal government comes into what's a state and local issue of policing and puts in place all these new standards and procedures and yet you have a department that's doing great on accountability they shouldn't have to completely transform um, but you did bring up a great point who's letting these problematic um, parts of union contracts be in there in the first place and that is the state and local politicians. And one of the problems then is public sector unions, you know, have an inherent flaw in them in that 
those unions are often funding the people who are in power and position to then give them those provisions in the contracts. And there have definitely been cases when unions will withdraw their support, including dollars, or they'll launch multi-million dollar attack ads against people who actually want to accomplish the reforms that are needed. Right. I think actually that's a really fantastic point that Rachel brings up because there is going to be a real political challenge to, to getting significant union reform in a lot of cities around the country. I mean, that's just the reality. It's been tried in Ohio and failed. Um, you know, I mean, even in Wisconsin, there was a recall on the governor, which he survived. But, uh, you know, one thing I think we, we ought to really consider is the fact that this is, as Commissioner Carrick pointed out, a negotiation. Right. And, and a lot of these provisions do come from a real place of sincere concern for things like job security, right? But policing uh, is the kind of job that uh, that offers you a, a sort of middle-class lifestyle or a path to a middle-class lifestyle that doesn't necessarily require a college degree or a high level of educational attainment. Um, the problem is, is that the deeper you get into a police career, if you don't have that credential, uh, the more attenuated you become from any skill set that's really transferable to another way of life that will allow you to sustain a family. And, and so there are real uh, real sort of job security concerns at play here. And, and so because this is a negotiation, I think one thing that really ought to be considered that too often just isn't is, is offering more money, whether that's at the outset of an officer's career or just in, in terms of base salary in general, so that uh, you know, there's a little bit more of a, secu of, a, of a security blanket so that officers can have a little bit more of a nest egg built up should they run afoul of some rule, which you know, often is done unintentionally. Um, that ends up getting them fired. And I think that's actually something that, that could potentially lead to progress because it's, it's something that I think the rank and file would be really interested in hearing more about. Yeah, if, if we have time, uh, we'll get a little bit more into officer recruitment and retention, but you raise a very good point, Raphael. So I, I wanna stick with this theme for the moment of, of uh, sort of the issue of weeding out uh, bad cops. So all of the proposals that are out there, the House Democrats bill, Senate Republican bill, the president's executive order, uh, calls for greater transparency and accountability uh, in fully adjudicated cases, so after due process has been afforded, uh, to officers involved in excessive uses of force. Is this a good idea? Is this common ground that, that everyone should get behind? Are there any impediments to making this happen or, or pitfalls out there? Well, I think this is definitely common ground. I mean, it, it's, it seems relatively unobjectionable to, be, to me. I mean, I think that the, the main uh, sort of barrier to this is going to be a funding question, right? I mean, we often sort of hear the word police and think really large urban departments like New York or Chicago or L.A. But the reality is, is that policing is, is, is often, you know, uh, most of the police agencies, I should say, are, are, are in small suburban or exurban or urban areas that don't really have. Uh, the funding or the time or the bandwidth uh, to comply with a lot of these reporting requirements. So any effort that's going to uh, be successful, I think, is really going to have to start to spend some money here, um, which, you know, in the end could could turn out to be a substantial amount. But, you know, I do think it's it's well worth it. So John, the executive order. Yeah, go ahead, Bernie. Um, you know, I think. Um, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, all I was going to say is that the executive order on the funding issue, it, one, it, it directs the attorney general to establish a database that does this. Uh, it offers more funding for some proposals. On that one, it, it basically says you must report uh, instances of excessive use of force. And if you don't, you won't get uh, uh, funding. But there's funding for other, for other things. Let's move on to another proposal. So it's common ground, it seems, on, on transparency and accountability. So the president, uh, for instance, has proposed uh, what he refers to in his executive order as a co-responder program uh, in which social workers actually are going to be paired with police officers whenever possible to deal with individuals who are in distress. They've become criminally justice involved. Maybe they're victims, maybe they're perpetrators, and they are homeless, suffering uh, from some kind of a mental disorder, or, or they are addicted, substance abusers. And they're going to have these pairings in order to try to de-escalate uh, situations and, if appropriate, get these people to to treatment. Worthwhile reform? Any problems? Um, if, if if I can, yeah. I, I, I think it's I think it's uh, it's a little premature, John, to to make a uh, an assessment of whether it's going to work or not. It's a great idea, um, you know. But I've heard, you know, everybody's talking about it now, so. And especially at the chief level, at the commissioner level, um, are you going to have people responding to a 
911 call, you know, somebody is in distress, somebody's, you know, mental illness or homeless or, you know, some kind of addiction issue. Um, are they going out with cops or are they going out on their own? And my fear is, you know, some department, some city, uh, especially based on some of the mayors I've heard talking, um, they're going to have these social workers, so to speak, go out and respond to these calls. And the first time that happens and one of these people uh, approach someone, uh, maybe mental illness or whatever the case may be, whatever the job is, um, and winds up getting killed um, because that person turned violent or whatever the case may be, there's going to be a big issue. Um, are you going to have these people riding along with cops? Um, or are you going to have a response, you know, like in New York City, when you call 911 for an emergency medical situation, the ambulance goes, fire department sends EMTs, but the police go as well. Is that the way it's going to work? I think, although this sounds great, um, I think they got to be really careful on how they're going to, how they're going to, you know, institute this because at the end of the day, as we all know, uh, you know, just following what goes on, uh, you know, in the world today, an incident, uh, an event, a thing that looks, you know, uh, looks extremely peaceful can turn violent within a matter of seconds. And I'd hate for the wrong people to be there uh, or not the right people to be there um, if and when that happens. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah this also just brings up that you have you know, two very differently trained people, police and social workers. And then if they're both there in the same situation, you know, the police is responded to or is trained to respond in one manner. And what if the social worker then comes up and says, you should have responded this way, you know, who who is to say who did the right thing in that situation? And then just one other issue is considering that some of these, you know, thousands of these departments actually have fewer than 10 people in them. Do they even have the resources to have social workers paired with them? No, I think the oh, yeah. research. I think the research. Uh, the the resource uh, question is a, a really important one. Um, but also, I mean, the research question here is, uh, I think, being assumed, which is that things like crisis intervention uh, tactics and de-escalation tactics are uh, or can be expected to have a high rate of success. And I'm not sure that the research says uh, that's the case. I mean, there was a, a a really broad literature review of crisis intervention training in 2019. It was published in the Journal of uh, the American Academy of Psychiatry and Law. And what it concluded was that there's little evidence in the peer-reviewed literature that shows uh, crisis intervention uh, training has any objective uh, benefits on arrests, on officer injury, on citizen injury, or on use of force. Um, and even when you look at the, the research not necessarily focused on, uh, on crisis intervention training and just on de-escalation more generally, um, you know, any of the studies that actually draw meaningful conclusions about uh, the effectiveness of de-escalation tactics is, is, are, are really kind of limited by, by questionable research designs. There's, there's just simply not a lot of empirical support uh, for the idea that de-escalation training is going to be uh, uh, likely to, to actually achieve a lower rate of force uh, used in these instances. I mean, de-escalation training was, was invented in the mental health context. Uh, by mental health workers seeking to minimize violent instances that they had with with patients in, in mental health facilities. And uh, after 40 years of, of literature buildup, there's really a, a paucity of evidence uh, to show that this is going to have a substantial uh, effect, which I think is really important to consider here. So I, John, so, yeah, John one ahead. last thing. Yeah, um, please. I, I think it's, you know, uh, people also have to realize, and, and Raphael touched on it uh, a little, you know, in the NYPD, I think when I went through the police academy in 1986, I think, uh, you know, it was five months long. Today, it's almost eight months long. And in that eight months, you get de-escalation training. You get verbal judo. You get, you, you know, they are trained to the hilt. Um, and the answer, you know, every time we have an incident that the mainstream media blows out of proportion, it's all about training. Got to have more training. Got to train, train, train. Well, there's two issues with the training. I don't know if there's any more that a department like the NYPD, I don't know if there's any more they can do other than what they're doing already. But that's number one. And number two, the other, and this is touching on Raphael's thing and a couple issues now, money. 
you know, it's great to say we need more training. Uh, the NYPD does it, but there are thousands of departments around this country. You want to give them training. You want them, whether it's de-escalation training or whatever the case may be, whether it's special operations training, whether it's counterterrorism training, everybody wants them trained to the hilt, but they don't put that training money in the budget. So you're not going to get anywhere if you're not adding to the budget. And in the, in the capacity that we're talking, you're talking billions of dollars. Right. Um, so I, I think that's something people have to really consider. Yeah, I think a, a third thing you could add to that is it's not just money, but every time an officer is involved in training, that's an officer who's not out on the streets or an officer, frankly, who is not getting firearms training or some other kind of training that they could be getting. So there are a lot of choices exactly. that are involved. And, and you know, the police certainly, ever since the deinstitutionalization movement in the, in the 60s and 70s, you know, police officers and, and to some extent prison officials are now dealing with folks who, you know, with, with mental disorders and the problem. And, and our police officers are called upon to do a lot more and, and a lot differently than they than they used to. So let, let, let's move on. We've got several other issues I want to get your thoughts on. So the president and his executive order uh, has called for a, a credentialing program uh, and to incentivize local police forces to seek out to have their policies and uh, reviewed under this credentialing program. Good idea, bad idea? I mean, I think it could be an interesting idea if done right, which you don't want is kind of a race to the bottom type effect. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I just worry about what the, the sort of thought process is here, because I, I think we have to be realistic about the size of the problem that we're trying to solve through these things. And, you know, as I've written many times in the past couple of weeks, you know, when we talk about uh, police use of force, which is really what sparked all of these reform proposals, it really just isn't that common a thing. Uh, it just isn't that common an occurrence. And, you know, police departments across the country have made significant progress on reducing the amount of both deadly and non-deadly force that they use. There's been very little recognition of that in the sort of rhetorical posture of police critics. And, uh, you know, so one of the things I, I think we have to just kind of keep in mind as we evaluate all of these ideas uh, is just the potential, the realistic potential that they have to make a difference in people's minds. Um, and, and I fear, based on recent events, that um, there's really not a whole lot you can do to change the mind of a lot of police critics. And, um, you know, so as you mentioned, the, the more kind of time and effort and resources that we spend on some of these ideas, the danger is that those are fewer uh, units of time and fewer resources going into the actual mission of policing, which is going to have real consequences in terms of public safety, which at, at the end of the day really should be the lodestar here. John, if I, if I can, just a second, um, you know, on the accreditation issue, uh, you know, within the Department of Correction and, and Correction uh, Industries around the country, there is an accreditation process um, and usually uh, most agencies go through uh, NIC uh, from Justice or the American Correctional Association. Um, I can also tell you that it sets standards, you know, uh, minimum standards for correction and, and uh, best practices. Um, I think it's a, it's a pretty good thing um, it, for departments to look at be best practices uh, and, and institute uh, those that benefit the agency and the, and the industry. But I will tell you, this is another money issue. This is definitely, it's definitely a money issue. So, uh, you know, if they're gonna do this to, uh, within every police department, that incentivized, you know, federal grant, um, that incentivized federal grant is gonna have to go through, you know, getting the department up to speed, uh, you know, the training issues, I think accreditation is good. It's got to be realistic, um, and and people have to keep in mind this is all about funding. So let's Can I stick just with yeah. Please, say, go ahead. Everybody Rachel. focuses a lot on the federal budget. Um, that the more that you tie federal funds to things, and in many instances we impose these unfunded mandates on the states, and in a lot of ways that's what we're talking about here. You end up essentially taking away state and local authority, and that's not what we want to do in this situation. That's true. So let's let's stick with money. Uh, and another sort of common proposal that that that's out there, uh, which is increased use of uh, of body cameras and patrol car 
uh, cameras. Obviously, they're being more widely deployed now. Uh, and you know, you've seen instances in which bad things have been captured on those body control, uh, on those body cameras, and not just by people holding up their cell phones. But you've, there have also been instances of allegations of police brutality that have been debunked because you know. Let's roll the videotape, as Warner Wolf in New York used to uh, uh, used to say. Uh, uh, good idea, bad idea. Any pitfalls with increased use of, of body cameras and patrol car cameras? I I have to tell you, uh, John. I I think I was one of the first major agencies to put the cameras in the New York City NYPD highway cars. Um, I I got to be honest, and, and just as I told the union then, who was opposed to it. I said, I think it's gonna help your men and women uh, more than it hurts them. And I, I am absolutely positive I'm right. Um, you know, the footage that we have captured through body cams have vindicated many more cops than have proved bad cops. Right. So I gotta be honest, from an executive point of view, I don't have an issue with it. I think cops should wear body cams uh, where possible. Uh, I think we should have dash cams in cars. It not only uh, highlights what happened during the incident, but a lot of these incidents, many incidents, uh, unfortunately, go bad. We've had cops shot and killed on car stops. We've had, uh, you know, really bad things happen, and we were able to go back, identify people uh, through investigative, uh, through investigations, and identify the people, the suspects responsible. So, personally, I don't think uh, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think we should use them uh, as much as possible, where possible. Um, and I think that's something that should be considered. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think this is uh, really uh, just a, a kind of win-win situation uh, type of idea. Um, now, what's interesting is that the original body cam proposals uh, started to come out about 10 years ago, and they were motivated by the um, sort of assumption that having body cameras would actually sort of mitigate police misbehavior uh, because they, they knew that they were being filmed. In reality, there's, there's been quite a bit of research on this. Um, body cameras have not seemed to have had any real effect on, on police behavior at all. Um, however, they do seem uh, to have some real benefits. One, as, as Commissioner Carrick mentioned, is that they often provide evidence used in prosecutions um, and aid in investigations, which of course makes you know, the endeavor of, of, of prosecution much more efficient because uh, you know, if, if you've got evidence of someone on tape, they're much less likely to dispute charges. Um, but, but also, uh, you know, the available evidence suggests that it will also lower frivolous complaints. Um, which is which is really interesting um, because it, it it seems that uh, you know we it could actually also end up being a, a money saver in at least some respects. Um, so you know this is one of those areas where where I do think it's worth spending the money. Um, there is a downside, however, for the public that I I don't think uh, gets a ton of attention. But what the data show uh, is that when police have body cameras, they are much less likely. Um, to to use discretion and and give people breaks um, when it comes to things like ticketing uh, and citations, uh, and that's because of a fear of, of sort of being dinged for for noncompliance uh, by their superiors. And I'm not sure there's a really uh, easy way around that concern, but it, but it's something that that people should be aware of. Yeah, there's storage issues and privacy issues. I suppose people have to deal with too. And you know, you you pointed out uh, showing what happened will will eliminate. Uh, frivolous complaints made against police officers, but they will also verify meritorious complaints. Uh, and so people, you know, that due process will be provided other than, of course, in, unless there's something happening off camera that you know, needs to be explained. Um, another benefit. Well, let me, let me get to one of the more controversial uh, proposals, and this is in the House bill. And essentially, uh, the House bill would do away with qualified immunity uh, for police officers. So there are some actually even conservatives and libertarians uh, who argue that qualified immunity is, is judge-made law and that the Supreme Court's jurisprudence has made it too difficult to sue police officers who violate the constitutional rights of civilians. One, one thing that I worry about is doing away with qualified immunity might hurt recruitment. It also could lead to you know, the so-called Ferguson effect, officers hesitating before going into dicey situations, kind of going on steroids 
I'm curious to get your thoughts about these proposals to do away with or modify qualified immunity. John, uh, when I when I hear the argument about qualified immunity, I I don't know if it's <clears throat> I don't know if it's something that's been focused on since I left, and I left a while ago. But I can tell you that every day, as a New York City police commissioner or as the correction commissioner, I average I don't know five lawsuits a day, at at a minimum five a day from civilians that was suing the department, suing me, suing cops, suing cops and everybody up the chain of command to the mayor um, every single day. So I'm not sure where this, where, where the qualified immunity starts and ends, but I can tell you in New York City, um, I don't really, personally, I don't think it's, it has an impact on, uh, on officer, uh, you know, uh, officers uh, work uh, or the department's work because uh, I haven't seen it personally I haven't seen it yeah I mean I, I got to piggyback on that uh, you know this is something where I think both sides of this debate are, are, are overstating their case to some degree um, because we have some empirical evidence on qualified immunity right in in New York City specifically with respect to the NYPD there's there's a database called caps that that uh, looks at uh, NYPD litigation uh, between 2015 and 18, and it's got about 25, 2,600 cases in that database, only 74 of which uh, were resolved in favor of police defendants. Um, and that's just any resolution, not necessarily based on qualified immunity. And then, of course, uh, there was some empirical work done by a UCLA law professor named Joanna Shorts um, that looked at about 1,000 cases uh, across several jurisdictions over uh, a couple of years. and and about 900 cases uh, were cases in which the defense of qualified immunity could be raised, and yet just 3.9% of those cases were dismissed or granted summary judgment in whole or in part on qualified immunity grounds. The reality is, is that most of these cases get tossed, uh, uh, you know, by by other means. And and I should note here that that Professor Schwartz has since in the Wall Street Journal uh, it, it, it expressed uh, or taken umbrage with with my characterization of of her study, but, you know, uh, and, and so I think it's only fair to kind of put it in her words. And in a recent uh, law review article for the Columbia Law Review, um, she wrote that eliminating qualified immunity would not dramatically increase plaintiff success rates or transform government practices that currently dampen the effects of lawsuits on officers and officials' decision-making and constitutional litigation would often still fail to hold uh, government officials accountable when they exercise power irresponsibly. And so again, you know, when we, I, I understand the sort of mechanics of the logical argument in favor of eliminating qualified immunity. And I also understand the, the, the mechanics of the logical argument uh, in opposition to it. But the empirics say, uh, as, as Commissioner Carrick noted, that, that the actual impact on police behavior is likely to be uh, at, at the margins rather than at the center of the distribution. Now, hey, John. I, I, yeah, John, one last thing. Yeah. You know, when I when I listen to when I when I hear all the rhetoric in Washington, whether it's about the executive or whatever, or it's about the House bill or about the Senate bill, keep in mind the majority of what I hear in reality is probably already being done um, in some capacity, in many capacities. Whether it's the chokehold issue, whether it's the the qualified immunity issue, which really isn't an issue uh, in my opinion, whether it's more body cams, uh, you know, can we do more? We probably can, but are we doing an enormous amount already? Yes. You know, when I hear these things and I hear people talking about them, they're talking about it like it's some new thing, like this is new and we have to do this. We're already doing it. We're already doing all the majority of the stuff we're talking about. We're already addressing it. So I think a lot of this is a jump to get something, put something public, make it public and talk about it uh, for a political reason. But at the end of the day, it's not like we're not doing this stuff already. So I that, go ahead. Could I just real quick on yeah. qualified immunity, I just must, I don't think it's an all or nothing issue. And so I don't think that we need to necessarily do away with it entirely. And you know, the purpose of having qualified immunity is to give a little bit of breathing room to public officials and with police in particular, people who are tasked with making split second decisions when they don't have all the information behind them. And so that's why we have these elevated levels of protection for them in lawsuits. Um, yet 
civil immunity has shifted a little bit over time, and particularly after 2009 and the Supreme Court's interpretation there, you know, I think what we might want to look back at is addressing what's become a bit of a catch-22 where lawsuits can get thrown out just because you don't have a case that has a clearly established precedent in which an almost identical incident um, in an almost identical case of you know, physical force or brutality has occurred, you know, if that's not there, even though that might have been a legitimate, you know, wrongdoing, the case gets thrown out and isn't processed through. And so I think there is a role for just reviewing this, the statute right now. Yeah, well, it's, it's not so much a statute, it's more judge-made law. And one of the criticisms is that the Supreme Court has made it, that in order for something to be clearly established, it, there has to be a case that is like on all fours. Uh, with the current case, and perhaps that too stringent a standard. Uh, we could say more about qualified immunity. I want to uh, move on. I want to sort of pick up on something that, that Bernie said. So Bernie said, you know, well, everyone's talking about stuff as if there's nothing new under the sun, and a lot of this stuff is being done, and I, I agree with that. Uh, and Raphael talked before about officer recruitment and retention. So I want to build on both of those themes. Obviously, you know, both the police know they have a problem. When an incident like George Floyd happens, like ripping a scab uh, off of an old wound and rubbing salt into it. There's a lot of historical baggage that the police department uh, carries with it. So what is it going to take to improve you know, relations between police officials and the communities that they have been sworn to serve and protect? So let me, let me start uh, by saying this. You know, in New York City, um, the NYPD, in reality, has phenomenal, phenomenal relationships in the communities. Their precinct commanders have a mandate to get into the communities. They have community service officers. They have uh, community policing officers. They have a number of people that's designated to reach out to the advocates in the community, the community leaders, to know them, to have coffee with them, to interact with them. That, that's in the NYPD, and I, and I would say in a lot of the major cities around the country, um, you know, so that, that stuff is already being done. Um, can it be done more? Can people do more to interact with the communities? Yes. But I also think we have to be truthful. Um, and the people, in, whether it's those communities or whether it's the people talking about those communities, we have to be truthful in the fact that some of these areas where the most police interaction is with those communities, they're extremely violent areas. You know, uh, and, and I, here, here's the thing that, that bothers me when you try to talk to somebody about what the police do and why and where. I've heard people, they've told me to my face, men and women in law enforcement, cops go out and they go out to target black men and women. They go out to target blacks, Latinos. That's what they're doing. You know, that's, that's a lie. Nobody's going out to target somebody because of the color of their skin. We take a big map of an area. It's called a heat map. And on that map, we map out where the crime is where the violent crime is, the seven crime indicators that the FBI monitors, whether it's murder, rape, burglary, grand larceny, uh, auto larceny, we map shootings, we map that stuff out. That's where we send the cops, where the most violent crime is. When you look at New York City back in 19, from 94 to 2002, when we reduced violent crime by 63% in, in uh, you know, murder by 70, those black communities, like Bed-Stuy, Crown Heights, and others, the murder rate dropped almost 80%. 80%. Why? Because that's where the crime was, and that's where we were sending the cops. Um, when you have a lot of cops going into those areas where the crime is the highest, of course, you're going to have negative interactions. It has nothing to do with color. And, it, and I think it's extremely important for people to realize that, especially departments, how important it is to have good relationships in those communities so that when something does happen, that they have an understanding of what the cops were doing there, why they were there, what was going on when they were there. And, uh, and I think it makes for, better, for better, better public access to that information because otherwise you're left to the mainstream media and the, the l lunatics out there 
that immediately, you know, it's, it's a racial issue. It's not a racial issue. It had nothing to do with race. It had something to do with sending cops into a community to reduce the crime, reduce the murder. Um, if I could uh, one um, thing that I think would be the most bang for the bulk in terms of shifting the culture. You know, I look at my own understanding and interpretation of police, and I think of them as heroes who are out there to help protect us, and they're putting their lives on the line. And where did I get that view? It was in elementary school when a police officer came in through a drug abuse resistance education program and just having positive interactions with those. And nowadays, we have more school resource officers who are in the schools and can provide, you know, a hugely beneficial and positive interaction and to establish those types of relationships and i think a lot of this you have so much more value when it starts young as opposed to trying to do it when people are already adults and grown and out on the streets and yet it's really sad to see i've got six young kids and our school district has talked about now pulling back their contracts with our local police department in light of everything that's happening and taking those school resource officers out of the schools and that's the opposite of what we should be doing i think Rafael? Yeah, I mean, I'm actually really pessimistic about the potential for significantly improving police community relations, and I'll tell you why. Uh, because this moment that we're in right now, I think, really illustrates the power of narrative to overwhelm uh, data and facts, right? We have seen uh, before our eyes the creation of the impression that things like police brutality, things like what we saw happen to George Floyd, are regular occurrences as opposed to aberrations. Um, that impression to me is indefensible and completely unmoored from what the data say, yet people believe just that, right? There was a 2016 morning consult poll, which found that twice as many black respondents reported worrying more about uh, those they know becoming the victims of police brutality than of gun violence, twice as many. And consider also that uh, there was a study published in the American Sociological Review in 2016 that showed that high profile cases of police violence actually led to black residents being less likely to report crimes. This is incredibly problematic for a host of reasons, starting with the fact that it's just not true, right? I mean, there was a recent study published uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, which put the odds of dying in the hands of police for black men at one in 1,000. Now, if you contrast that with the odds for all Americans generally of being killed by gun assault, um, according to the National Safety Council, uh, they're dramatically higher at one in 298. And that's for all Americans generally. And we know that black men are more than 10 times more likely than their white counterparts to be the victim of a homicide. Uh, so the risk of death at the hands of police is by orders of magnitude significantly lower uh, uh, than, than, than the, the odds of dying of, as a result of a general homicide. And you know when the data point so far in the opposite direction, yet the sort of rhetorical posture of this debate is overwhelmingly reflecting uh, something that the data belie, I, I just truly worry that uh, we've sort of reached the point of no return. Um, and as far as Rachel's uh, suggestion goes, I, I think it's a great one, but I also think it's going to end up running up against the reality that our educational institutions and, and our ed schools of education that educate our teachers are extremely left-wing in their orientation and, and indoctrinate people uh, at the outset of their careers. And, you know, my, my, I have lots of, of, of teachers in my family and, and friends, and, you know, they all tell me the same thing, that their schools are completely on board with, with the rhetoric about police that, that uh, you know, indicates that they're problematic and racially oppressive cogs in a in, in an even more racially oppressive criminal justice system and um uh, again i just uh i i really truly worry that uh that there's a way around that so i i, I knew this would happen we're going to run out of time and have more issues to cover um so i've got a couple of great questions from from audience members so i want to get your quick impressions about them and they're about particular proposals that have been made so one of them has to do with no knock warrants and this is of course a reaction to the really tragic death of brioni taylor uh, the House bill basically would ban uh, no-knock warrants. In the Senate, a bill requires judicial approval, uh, approval, and it also asks for federal and state authorities to do regular reporting about their usage of no-knock warrants. Just curious to get your reaction about uh, about these proposals on no-knock warrants. The, the only uh, the the only thing I would say, uh, John, I I don't have any problem with uh, have, maintaining a database, uh, reporting, uh, you know, the aftermath of these. But I will tell you, um, to diminish or take the ability away 
from the enforcement agents um, to determine whether it should be a no-knock warrant or not and use it if, if they deem necessary is endangering the lives of everybody on that warrant. I've done them. I work for the DEA uh, and, and major narcotics uh, enforcement in the NYPD from 89 to 94, and I can tell you I've done many. Um, met quite often, the no-knock warrant is, is done for the element of surprise because the people on the other side of that door is extremely dangerous. Um, and to take that ability away from your law enforcement officers is just, in my opinion, it's outrageous. Should not happen. So, so my quick reaction to this is 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 basically that uh, an outright ban is is uh, the wrong way to go about this. Um, I, I have suggested um, in in a set of reforms that I've put forward to the Manhattan Institute that one thing to consider is is requiring uh, commanding officers to submit sort of written documentation laying out why a no-knock warrant in a particular case is the best tactical option and to have that get approved by some sort of internal body uh, within the department so that there's accountability should something go awry. Uh, but I do agree with Commissioner Carrick that sometimes that is the right tactical option and to take that completely off the table is, is, is exactly the wrong way to go about it. Also, speaking about tactical options, I got another great uh, a question talking about another, uh, perhaps even more controversial area, which is you all know that there is a federal program uh, in which surplus military material uh, can be transferred from the Department of Defense to uh, federal law enforcement agencies. And in fact, over the years, several billion dollars worth of such equipment has been transferred. The House bill uh, seeks to, to limit this. When President Obama was in office, he dramatically cut back on the program, it was reinstated uh, by uh, by President Trump. Thoughts on uh, on on these programs of transferring, quote unquote, military grade equipment to law enforcement officers. Good idea, bad idea, should it be pruned? If, if I could jump, go ahead, go ahead, Rafi. Yeah, I was going to say. I mean, this is, I think, another one of these instances in which the empirical data just really don't support uh, the case being prosecuted against the 1033 program here. Uh, there have been, you know, really well done empirical assessments of the effects of, of the 1033 program, which is the program through which uh, police departments acquire this uh, equipment. Those assessments has, have found that departments that acquire these equipment find reduced citizen complaints, as well as reductions uh, on uh, police officers, as well as deaths of officers um, in the field. More relevantly, uh, they don't have any effect on police shootings. Um, they don't have any effect on police use of force. Um, another uh, a study uh, of the 1033 program not only found uh, a similar null effect on the number of offenders uh, killed uh, by police, but it actually found um, a significant deterrent effect on crime because the show of force made people much less likely to violently resist. Um, and, and I think, you know, this is just another one of these areas where we, we ought to be demanding more of the people prosecuting the case against this program to, to sort of show their cards and make their empirical case. That's, I think he answered it, John. Okay. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes left. Uh, I, I just, I have to get your, first of all, you can offer any final thoughts you might have, but the defund or dismantle movement that is is going on. And, you know, as you know, uh, Bernie Bill de Blasio uh, has already said that he's going to cut back dramatically in NYPD funding. I think Eric uh, uh, Garcetti in, uh, in Los Angeles has said $150 million is going to be transferred and you know reallocated away from the police forces. Uh, city Council in Minneapolis, a veto-proof uh, majority, has said that they are going to defund the police departments. <laughs> what do you make? What do you make of all of this? And where is this is this going? And then offer any final thoughts you might have, since we only have a couple of minutes left. So here's here's um, here's to sum it up in a word, lunacy. Um, and here's why. Everybody's complaining about the cities that have the most violent crime and most murder. Um, you know, there's a constant uh, theme behind these cities. Like I said, Chicago, Baltimore, St. Louis, and others. Well, guess what? Defund the police. Diminish them in any way. You limit or, or you take away resources from enforcement in those areas. You take away enforcement in those areas, more people are going to die. That's the bottom line. There's there's no way around it. If you don't have the cops out there, if they're not able to get into those communities where the, the highest crime is and the murder rate is going through the roof, 
you're going to have a higher murder rate and higher violent crime. That's the bottom line. There's no way around that. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. We've seen uh, through studies what the reduction in police proactivity does in high crime areas. We've seen it in Chicago. We've seen it in Baltimore. And so one of the questions that I would ask people who seriously offer the policy proposal of defunding the police is the following, which is, do you think it's a coincidence that the weekend of May 31st was the most violent weekend in Chicago's uh, history over the course of the year? Uh, while police were were out in other parts of the city quelling violent riots. Do you think it's a coincidence that May 31st itself is the single most violent day in Chicago's history since 1961, which is when they started keeping track, again, while police were out in Midtown, in downtown, quelling riots rather than in the neighborhoods where violent crime is? Uh, the idea that criminals will not take advantage of a uh, reduced police presence, I think, is, is not only... Uh, uh, just a totally unmoored from what the empirics say, but is is ir an irresponsible game being played often by people who don't live in the communities uh, on whom they are, are imposing these risks. And, and it really is, to me, just quite the height of irresponsibility. Any final thoughts, Ray? Just that it's ridiculous policy, and this is going to end up having the most severe consequences on minority communities, lower income communities, the exact same people that the protesters are so-called wanting to protect. Yeah, no, I, I think if these, these decisions get made, and many of them might, that people will reap what they sow, and these are certainly uh, uh, troubling times. Well, I, I knew this would happen, which is I knew that this hour was going to, to fly by. Uh, so I wanna thank, uh, thank you all for participating, and, and thank uh, those of you who signed in and have been observing the uh, the webinar and and I guess uh, on behalf of the Heritage Foundation uh, and the Federalist Society uh, we are concluded. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thanks.